Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Damage Report. I'm John Adarola and we've got a big show with stories and guests. Some stories, I don't know for sure which, some guests, I'm not sure of that either. But we will get to a bunch of it at some point. Lots to get to today. And I wanna start off by talking about something that has absolutely nothing to do with the news whatsoever. It's just something I've been thinking about. So very briefly, humor me. Um, this last uh, week, we saw uh, the big battle of Winterfell in Game of Thrones that became the most tweeted about episode of TV in history, which is an amazing achievement. And as a person who has been like, I grew up on fantasy novels and series and things like that, including Game of Thrones long before HBO considered making it a pilot. The idea that this story about like cold zombies and stuff like that would ever be not just like a thing that's accepted in mass culture. I mean, there's things like that, you know, Walking Dead and stuff like that. But the most tweeted about episode of TV, a phenomenon that takes over the country is so bizarre. And in the same week as Avengers Endgame, which is literally a movie of superheroes running around and punching each other, this is the most mainstream thing ever is quite amazing. And I just wanna take this opportunity to say to you, since there's a good chance that you like Game of Thrones, that you enjoyed it. Many of you might not have ever watched or read anything like Game of Thrones before. You've, you've rarely been interested in swords and horses and catapults and stuff like that. But it turns out pretty exciting, pretty dramatic, cool action, stuff like that. Well, I would just like to say to you, if you do like it, first of all, thank you. Second of all, there are so many other awesome fantasy series out there, some in TV form, far more in written form, that you might be surprised to find out that you enjoy as well. And if you like blood magic and shadow magic in a way that you never thought possible before, there's some great stuff out there. There are like if you like big epic series, like look into Robert Jordan and the Wheel of Time. It's even bigger, more epic in scope, and pretty awesome actually. Um, if you like seeing strong, dynamic female characters, Octavia Butler has written so many awesome fantasy and sci-fi series that feature protagonists of all different sorts with interesting philosophical conundrums and just cool high concept uh, sci-fi uh, premises and things like that. If you want something light and funny, as some of these these episodes of Game of Thrones are, um, is it a, a, a Piers Anthony, I think it was. I haven't read one of his in a while, but very funny stuff, lots of puns and everything. Anyway, my point in bringing this up is if your eyes have been opened to how entertaining this stuff can be, there is so much out there. So just give it a try, you might be surprised at what you find. Now with that, let's jump into stuff that'll once again anger me. I was briefly relaxed, we'll see how long that lasts. Let's turn now to a meme that was posted by Chase on Twitter. That was so dumb, so needlessly cruel that it took me a day to process exactly what I want to say about it. So here it is. This is what they posted on Twitter. You, why is my balance so low? Bank account, make coffee at home, bank account, eat the food that's already in the fridge, bank account. You don't need a cab, it's only three blocks. You, I guess we'll never know, bank account. Seriously, hashtag Monday motivation. It did provide motivation, but not necessarily for what Chase wanted. So I guess. The point of that was, hey, we're gonna sort of poke fun at the ways that people aren't as financially responsible as we think that they should be. Um, this is one of the most tone deaf tweets I have literally ever seen in my life. Earlier today, uh, when I started producing it and uh, Brooke took a look at it, she started laughing at the tweet because it is so on its face absurdly tone deaf and cruel to people who are experiencing real economic hardship. This is effectively a 280 character long avocado toast tweet. That's all it is. And it just happens to have been tweeted by one of the wealthiest companies in the history of our planet. So in the wake of this tweet coming out, a lot of people have noticed some sort of some weird facts that are perhaps important when you're diagnosing whether Chase is in a position to be giving us financial advice and telling us that our financial priorities are out of line. Do you remember that Chase accepted $12 billion in bailout money following the 2008 financial crisis? Maybe if they just had used less Ubers along the way, then they would have been able to, to store enough money in savings to not need a massive bailout paid for by you and I. Did you know that at the same time that Chase is telling people that they should stop, they should keep re, like reheating their food rather than going out every once in a while, that they charge up to $34 for overdrafts? Um, 
And I, I happen to remember before there was at least a little bit of overdraft reform uh, under the, the Obama administration. Do you remember the fun scam they had for years where if you had a, a big charge and a bunch of small charges, what they would do is they would reorder the charges so that your account is tapped out with the one big one. And then all the little ones would trigger so you'd be hit with overdraft five times, 10 times, 20 times and they could rack up huge fees. It's weird how they didn't mention that in the tweet. They made it seem as if they had nothing to do with the financial situation that people find themselves in. That it just, hey, you're being irresponsible. You should be, no, don't go to Starbucks, okay? That will solve all your problems. That's probably how Jamie Dimon and other execs at these banks have become so wealthy. They make their own coffee, they grind their own beans, I guess. That must be. What it is, um, but thankfully, people who are involved in some of the efforts to rid us of what the, the abuses that these banks have been levying on us for so long, including Elizabeth Warren, have noticed this, and she tweeted, "Chase, why aren't customers saving money? Taxpayers, we lost our jobs, homes, savings, but gave you a twenty-five billion dollar bailout. Workers, employers don't pay living wages. Economists, rising costs and stagnant wages equal zero savings. Chase, guess we'll never know. Everyone, seriously." And that is why someone with the both the financial understanding, but also the prioritizing of putting workers' rights ahead of the rights of gigantic banks and other corporations like Elizabeth Warren desperately needs to occupy the Oval Office in 2020. Someone who actually gets it, who's not going to pander us to us with these nonsense memes, totally misunderstanding virtually everything that we know about the economy, both before and after the financial recession. And here's the thing. Like it's not like people don't get it. People do get it. Not just the politicians, the regular people who are going to be choosing these politicians in 2020. Eight in ten Democrats, more than six in ten independents, and nearly one third of Republicans believe, quote, the country's economic system gives an advantage to those already in power rather than all Americans. I don't have an explanation for you as to why so many Republicans remain immune to that understanding because I got news for you. While they might tend to be a little bit more wealthy, it's not 70% of Republicans that are making out like bandits under the current system, but many of them have been successfully brainwashed against what's actually being done. And one more thing, actually two more things. One, so Jamie Dimon recently was being questioned, I think by Representative Porter, about a new teller. There's an actual person who was a teller at a Chase Bank. I believe it was in. I think it was in the Long Beach area. And they ran the numbers on the salary that she was getting and with just Basic expenses, rent, food, car, health insurance, the normal things that you need. She was actually losing with her salary as a new teller at Chase over $500 every month. She couldn't even make ends meet on the basic stuff. And so they asked, how do you actually, how do you, how do you explain this? Like, how are they supposed to survive? And he stumbled around and he bumbled around and he said, well, you know what? If she works her way up someday, she might be making the money that I'm making. Yeah, but she's not going to make it. She's not going to make it if the first month she's in the hole $500. And then it's worse every month after that, just for the basic stuff. We're not talking about lattes at Starbucks. We're not talking about casually taking Ubers downtown or anything like that. We're talking about the basic things that you need to survive, let alone emergencies and all of that. They had no answer whatsoever to the most basic questioning of the status quo that they have helped to set up. Thankfully, there are people who do though. And so I want to turn to something a little bit more positive. Over the first weekend of its release, Avengers Endgame has broken records, made history with $1.2 billion in profits. And Bernie Sanders has an idea of where Disney might want to put some of those profits. He tweeted, what would be truly heroic is if Disney used its profits from Avengers to pay all of its workers a middle class wage instead of its CEO, Bob Iger, $65.6 million, over 1400 times as much as the average worker at Disney makes. Look, if you've been paying attention to these stats over the past couple of decades, you probably know that the average worker makes a smaller and smaller fraction of what the CEO does. But even I didn't think it had gotten up to 1400 times the disparity between the CEO and worker when it comes to Disney, an incredibly wealthy and successful corporation, by the way, that has less excuse than others for this sort of inequality between its lowest and highest workers. And here is why Bernie Sanders is talking about Disney. Now, obviously, in the past year or two, he's been working out with some of the workers at Disney to help them when they were striking, some success there. The issue is that Disney, which has previously in the uh, the California, like Southern California area, has been the beneficiary of a number of different subsidies and tax incentives and things like that. 
they ran up against a new regulation. And so uh, there's a new ordinance uh, that would require large companies that receive municipal tax breaks to pay workers $15 an hour. That number will eventually go up to $18 an hour by 2020, uh, 2022 and keep pace with inflation thereafter. Uh, that number, by the way, is even less than the uh, average salary of the Chase Tellers that are such an issue that we were talking about earlier in the show. But it is at least something, and it's the result of uh, activists, workers' rights activists, and politicians like Bernie Sanders working incredibly hard to get us to that point. And Disney says, Nope, we're not going to pay them that amount, even if it means that we have to stop taking these subsidies and tax incentives. We will throw that money away because we don't want to set the precedent that we should pay our workers a living wage. And to give you an idea of how easy it would be for them to pay the average Disney worker an equitable wage, take a look at a recent quote from uh, this is Abigail Disney, granddaughter of co-founder Roy Disney, who recently said about that CEO, I like Bob Iger, let me be very clear, I think he's a good man, but I think he's allowing himself to go down a road that is the road everyone is going down. When he got his bonus last year, I did the math, and I figured out that he could have given personally out of pocket a 15% raise to everyone who worked at Disneyland and still walked away with $10 million. And she added that there is such a thing as people who have too much money. So look, that's Disneyland, that's just one executive salary. But imagine the massive profits that they are getting off of just one of their properties, Endgame, right now. It is not only gonna have that record breaking first weekend, I'm willing to bet it's second and third and fourth weekends are gonna be pretty good too. And yet even as they are racking in more and more money, and Disney is about as wealthy as media companies come, they are doing everything they can to avoid having to pay their workers. The people who make all of this possible an equitable and fair wage. But thankfully there are people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren who are watching this and hopefully they will soon have the power and authority to make sure that workers get what they deserve. And with that said, we are gonna take our first break. When we come back, lots more to get to. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be. Featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. And now we turn to other big stories from across the country, and we are joined to break those down by Emma Vigeland of Rebel HQ. Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on what is a particularly stressful day. It uh, makes me feel a lot better to have you uh, on the show with us, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm stressed too, so we can commiserate. Okay, well, uh, let's do it over a few different stories. We've got some serious stuff, some absurd stuff, and some stuff that is seriously absurd. And so why don't we start with the seriously absurd. Um, you're probably familiar with Jacob Wohl, I imagine, unfortunately. And yeah. uh, lobbyist Jack Berkman, um, they're massive, massive frauds, which in any other time than the one we dwell in would be a big issue for them, but now it's a benefit, if anything. And so their most recent scheme was that they were apparently trying to convince people and apparently did convince one person to claim that uh, the Democratic uh, candidate uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, tried to rape them effectively or did rape them. And um, uh, they are absolute 
ridiculous frauds, but also they're terrible at this. And so they were caught. And there's audio that's been released of them trying to convince people of this. One medium post had a person named Hunter Kelly who initially claimed, but then backtracked, said that Pete Buttigieg had actually raped him. So when you saw the story, which I believe was originally reported by the Daily Beast, what was your reaction? Well, you know, how is he able to get away with this on a consistent basis? Jacob Wool has tried this numerous times in the past. He is a smear merchant of the highest order. So that's my first reaction. And secondly, you know, could you imagine if someone on the left did anything close to what Jacob Wool has done over and over in the media? The double standards that are held to the left and to the right and to the activists on both sides are it's absolutely outrageous, but very predictable. So mm-hmm. uh, the you know, Jacob Wool is now basically weaponizing me too against Democrats and attempting to make sure that Pete Buttigieg is smeared in the way that a lot of Republican candidates have been with sexual harassment allegations and Democrats as well. But it really takes away from the validity of these actual allegations, but he couldn't care less about that. He's all about achieving one particular end and it's sociopathic in a way. Yeah, certainly in a way and probably in a few ways and and yeah, that's Outside of just him, like just having to think about him enrages me on a very fundamental level. And the fact that, like with a few of the other like fake investigators or whatever on the right, they can do whatever they want, they can say whatever they want, they're shown to be frauds over and over, and it doesn't matter. I mean, would you be shocked to find out that later this year some Republican millionaire gives him, you know, a million dollars to start a right wing news site or something? Like, there's nothing stopping that from happening, which is deeply yeah. frustrating. Um, yeah. Hasn't this hasn't you know been a new a new uh, a new phenomenon? Acorn is the greatest example of a right wing smear job that was just the media didn't really call it out and went along with it, and they were treated with legitimacy. I know Jacob Wall isn't necessarily treated with legitimacy, but he's equivocated with people on the left when it's absolutely there's no comparison to be had. Exactly, and 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 I I think. I mean, look, I don't watch Fox all the time, but I would not be shocked to find that him brought on to Sean Hannity to break down his latest report or something like that. I think that from the point of view of at least the right, he has more credibility than you or I could ever hope to have. He made a name for himself, and that is that is all you need at this point is to get people to talk about you. He's trended, never for anything positive. He's always looked ridiculous when he's trended, but he has trended, and that's all you really need. And so you mentioned with the the false sexual assault allegations, that's one of the things that bothers me so much about this is that his scheme doesn't have to succeed. Even by failing, even by being revealed, it just adds ammunition to the people who claim, yeah, sometimes these things are made up. Doesn't matter that it was us that made it up. It's now an open question as to whether any particular allegation should be paid attention to or considered seriously, and that bothers me. Of course, and also I would say that the um, Jacob Wall is operating under this false morality of that's why you know he's a right winger because he believes in traditional values and is trying to take down these candidates for that particular reason. But I don't know how moral it is to be manufacturing sexual assault allegations and smearing people publicly and not really caring that it discredits further accusers from reporting their rapes because he gets to trend on Twitter and he gets to you know, bring, achieve his political ends of tearing down all Democrats. It's not even a legislative end, it's just a smear job. Mm. And that's really what puts an even worse taste in my mouth about the whole situation. And what you're saying is right, you know, he's the product of, of, of this culture that also brought Donald Trump to the fore, which is all about getting your name out there for the sake of getting your name out there and notoriety for notoriety's sake. And the substance particularly doesn't matter. And which is why substantive people like us don't get the credit we deserve. <laughs> so here's my small violin for us. Exactly, exactly. I'm playing that as well. You can't see it, it's off camera. Um, exactly, and and just for those watching the show, please bear in mind, this is not just the the first time he's tried to create these false allegations. He apparently tried to do it with Robert Mueller as well. He is still not in prison. I have no idea why. It seems like some of this he's has got lying. to be against the law. 
He's white and a right winger, that's why. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I tweeted earlier today, I think that he was created in a lab to prove that white uh, privilege does exist. You can't look at him and say that there's anything other than that operating right now. So let's, with that said, although I could talk about that for 45 minutes and then blow my brains out, why don't we turn to more important topics. Uh, Joe Biden hasn't released a healthcare plan per se, but he did talk at least a little bit about what he would like to see happen in terms of healthcare in the near future, saying that he believes that people should be able to voluntarily buy into Medicare. So he's not in favor of Medicare for all, he's not in favor of getting rid of the private health insurance companies, but he is in favor of effectively a public option, what feels like 70 years after we last had that debate about a public option. Um, do you think that this position, what he will certainly pitch as a compromise, uh, is that a good path for him in this Democratic primary? Oh, come on, of course not. So let's let's talk about this in terms of you know the negatives first. So Biden is actually polling very well and has gotten a significant bump since his announcement. And he is specifically appealing to the boomer voters and he's doing pretty well at that. He has no discernible real policy goals except for continuing Obama. So he's Amy Klobuchar except with really, really white teeth. <laughs> and, um, and he is not running as a progressive and he really is open about not wanting to kind of appeal to that demographic while at the same time saying he's the most progressive candidate in the race. When when you look at his record, he was against segregation, he was for segregation, excuse me, in the 70s, he was against integration. He has obviously authored the draconian 1994 crime bill, which is infamously the biggest driver of mass incarceration. He voted for the Iraq war, I could go on and on and on the bankruptcy bill. So he's clearly not the most progressive candidate in the race. I would advise him to just steer clear of that rhetoric because it's super easily provable. Mm -hmm. And now when he's doing this debate with Bernie Sanders, he's positioning himself as the moderate. I would argue that a Medicare buy-in is the center right position on healthcare because we have to continue framing it, framing the debate in the way that the left, um, in the fact that the left is actually the center position. Medicare for all polls over 50% in every poll that you see up to 70% in many polls. It's the position that Americans really want. They want a single payer healthcare system. And buying into Medicare as a choice uh, is a right wing position. So it's you know allowing yourself to buy in to the marketplace as opposed to making healthcare as a right. So yeah. Joe Biden's position is not healthcare as a right, it's healthcare as a choice through a buy-in. And I don't think that that's what the Democratic primary voters want, let alone what the rest of the country wants. Yeah, I, I wish that we had much more time because I have some follow-ups on, on that. But I do wanna ask you about one other thing uh, in the time that we have. Uh, recently over the past couple of days, I've seen a number of different polls that, that certainly don't look like what you'd want them to look like if you were Donald Trump going into re-election. Um, one poll had 55% nationally saying that they definitely won't vote for him again. Um, one poll has him losing to both Biden and Bernie in Texas of all places. One has 30% of conservatives saying that they won't vote for him. Um, now we are only, I, I think that the 2020 election is in six years, so it's still a way, ways off. Um, these sorts of polls don't look good for him, but are they are they premature to get too excited about, or are they a hundred percent premature to get too excited about? Uh, the former, I would say, they're both they're all premature. But uh, saying having this specific block of voters, this large chunk, over fifty percent, saying that they will not vote for him, is disastrous. And with the chunk of his base saying that they will, being around. 30, 29%, it's equally disastrous. We know that that's his chunk of support and they're not moving no matter how many lies he tells, no matter how many Washington Post fact checks you get, <laughs> they are going to continue to show up to his rallies and they're gonna continue to vote for him. What matters is the people, the independents in the middle, and they're, the Washington speak is that you know it has to be a moderate, it has to be a moderate. Well, that didn't work out last time. It has to be a populist, it has to be someone who uh, really convinces the American public that they are going to change their lives for the better and that they're, they're going to see substantive change. Obviously, I think that's a candidate like Bernie Sanders or like Elizabeth Warren who can really sway that middle. The, pop, the middle is not uh, moderate, the middle is populist. And that's what these pollsters and these pundits have to get through their heads. Uh, I agree, and if anyone sees these sorts of uh, polls and then says, 
oh good, I can relax until November 2020. Uh, remember how November 2016 went? It was not a fun experience, <laughs> let's not go through that again. Uh, yes, so let's not nominate someone who's exactly like Hillary Clinton, but with white hair and Joe Biden. Exactly, yeah, I, I, it would be difficult to come up with another prominent Democrat with as many like booby traps just implicit in their record that are going to come up in the general election if he's the candidate. So that's a scary prospect. We'll end on that scary prospect. Emma, as always, thank you for joining us. If you all would like to see more of her work, she's on Rebel HQ, does a great job there. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. We're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, Ken Klippenstein is gonna be joining us to break down one of his recent stories from TYT.com on the apparently illegal actions of a Navy SEAL overseas. Joining us now to break down a fascinating story of potential war crimes committed by a Navy SEAL is a reporter at TYT Investigates, Ken Klippenstein. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Hey, John, good to see you. Uh, great to have you here and very excited uh, in particular to talk to you about this topic because it is a fascinating one. So uh, for those who might not be familiar with this story, uh, Edward Gallagher, uh, what is he alleged to have done and what's currently happening to him? He's alleged to have committed multiple war crimes when he was in um, Iraq. Um, he was a SEAL sniper, and apparently, when he was allegedly when he was in his sniper's nest, he picked off a, a young girl, and she was about ten years old, uh, an elderly man, and then um, he killed or uh, murdered allegedly um, a ISIS fighter that was a prisoner of war at the time. So he didn't pose a threat to anyone. And apparently, this ISIS fighter was, I believe, between the ages of twelve and seventeen, so like wow. a, you know, a young teenager. And so, look, uh, I think the idea that you would shoot an elderly man, shoot a girl, that's obviously reprehensible. It should be case closed there. Some will say he's a sniper, there's a crowd, God only knows what. But with, with the prisoner that he's alleged to have killed, um, the, the, if, I'm, if I'm right, and correct me if I'm wrong, he apparently stabbed him multiple times in the neck as he was being treated for wounds. Yes, another SEAL, um, a SEAL medic was uh, treating this individual who was apparently totally incapacitated by, um, I think it was airstrikes, didn't pose any sort of threat. And while he was treating him, uh, supposedly he walked up very calmly and just stabbed him uh, multiple times in the chest until he until he died. And um, I should note that you know the witnesses in this are other SEALs, so this is not you know rights organizations, these uh, or you know or, or people that. You know, uh, he, he might claim are, are, are critical of you know U.S. Yeah. foreign policy. These are his own um, comrades. And so, what, what's so what, what's currently happening with Edward Gallagher? Is he being held? Are there their charges pending? What, what's the legal situation? So right now he is being held. Um, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service—that's uh, the group that sort of polices the um, seals and then you know the Navy generally. Um, they're the ones lodging these charges, and it seems like they have, you know, multiple witnesses. Um, they keep adding more to it. Um, but um, since this case, you know, gained publicity, and the president actually tweeted about it, and the, you know, numerous Republicans have as well. Um, it's taken on a very political tone, so we might see it, um, you know, get stretched out longer than a case like this might. Uh, and so I honestly did not see Donald Trump's tweet about this. I assume that he's taking it seriously that a Navy SEAL would have committed a crime like this, right? <laughs> I wish um, the tweet was. I don't know that he addressed the allegation specifically, but he said that um, the seal should be. You know, he's kind of playing the nationalism. The, the tweet, as I recall, it was um, he needs to have better conditions um, while he's in prison. Always one of my favorite things. How much Republicans care about um, prison conditions when it when it affects somebody that they like, as opposed to prisoners yeah. generally. And so there's also a letter from the seal's brother that gives a couple of different arguments as to to why the charges either shouldn't be there in the first place or why we shouldn't be concerned about it. So what, what is the, the argument that the brother is, is giving? Well, what's incredible to me, and this letter was given to me by um, someone in Congress. This was a letter, not this wasn't an open letter. This was a private letter to, um, I'm told, other veterans in Congress. So uh, presumably he thought that this would be you know a sort of friendly crowd. So he kind of lets his hair down. And um, says, I'm going to try to find the exact word, so I'm not paraphrasing. Um, he says, despite the amounts of evidence showing this incident never happened, and the basic stupidity of charging a Navy SEAL with the death of an ISIS terrorist, 
um, the Navy has locked Eddie away for the past six months in a military break, and he goes on to describe the conditions. But what was amazing to me was that he says, the basic stupidity of charging a Navy SEAL with the death, with the death of an ISIS terrorist, as if there's no you know <laughs> conditions under which that might apply, as if there's no rule of law. Um, you know, Obviously, everyone knows ISIS is bad, but that doesn't mean that all you know, international laws and norms and our own domestic yeah. laws are suspended when you know we're at war with them. And it also seems like if you're gonna say uh, he didn't do it objectively, he did not kill this guy, but then you go on to say, and, and it wouldn't matter if he did, you, you can kill him like we were trying to kill him before. That to me undercuts the argument about whether it happened or not. You seem disinterested in the facts at that particular uh, uh, case. Exactly, and I should note this isn't some you know random person. This person's been uh, invited on you know numerous big Fox programs, including um, the Sean Hannity Show, yeah, um, the Fox and Friends. So this is you know he's sort of a spokesperson for for yeah. Gallagher. Uh, well, it's a great story. People should go to toic.com and read your write up about it. Um, I just had one other thing I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if you saw the news about Jacob Wohl and uh, apparently trying to get people to claim that Pete Buttigieg <sighs> had had raped him. Um, you are an investigative reporter, and so I am curious, how have you not yet landed him in prison? He is breaking the law constantly. You need to investigate him and get this guy locked up. So yeah, I was just thinking, what is it gonna, it's gonna be 2022 and he'll have done this to half a Congress and he's still running around. Uh, you know, FOIA I found showed the FBI did appear to be investigating it. But uh, yeah, what is charge is gonna be lodged? I don't know, I'm as surprised as you. I just, I can't. If I had done this, wouldn't I be in jail if I tried to get false rape allegations created for multiple high profile politicians? But I guess the first two are free, I guess. <laughs> anyway, Ken Klippenstein, as always, thank you for joining us. Appreciate your reporting. Thanks a lot, man. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we have a candidate who's gonna be joining us for running for Congress in Texas, Adrian Bell, after this. Joining us now is the Democratic congressional candidate for Texas's 14th district in this upcoming election, Adrian Bell. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you so much, John, for having me. I really appreciate being able to talk with you today. Uh, glad to have you here, and uh, especially glad to have you as one of the first candidates that we are talking with in this cycle. Um, we previously spoke at, at one point on the main Young Turk show uh, in the last cycle um, when you had been running for Congress there. And so, so talk to me about uh, this this time around. So it's a hard district that you're running in, yes. and uh, yes. but but you've got even more experience now. So so talk to me about uh, what it's like this this time around. Okay, well, you know, Texas is so exciting being in Texas right now because we have been identified as a battleground state. And last year we were considered just, you know, red. There's nothing much that's gonna happen in Texas. But those of us who are in Texas, we have been working, we have been organizing. And so we see the fruition of a lot of labor from a lot of different organizations, a lot of different individuals, and a lot of activists. And so now when we're running in 2020, we garnered 92,000 votes last a cycle. So we can capitalize on those 92,000 uh, votes that have already been cast for us and build upon that. So yes, Texas is hard because Texas is a huge state. Mm -hmm. This district, I spent a lot of time driving, a lot of windshield time. So we're not very dense. We have to move around quite a bit in order to visit constituents so that they can we can hear their issues and we can talk about solutions. But we're ready, we're excited uh, to get going, we're, we're kicking off and we have our first kickoff on May 11th in the Beaumont, Port Arthur area and we're getting it rolling. Well, let's talk about one of these areas of public policy. Your, your background is in education and in that area, we've actually heard some pretty big proposals coming from some of the presidential candidates like Elizabeth Warren, different ways to deal with the various problems that we have in our education system across America. Based on your experience in this field, what are some of the things you'd like to accomplish if you make it to Congress? One thing is pre-K education. We are doing our children a disservice by not educating them at an earlier age and making sure that they have the groundwork, the firm foundation in order to learn. Uh, currently, I teach fourth grade in the public education uh, system in Houston. And we have students that are not reading on grade level. I have one student that actually does not know his letters. So we have a long way to go to make sure that our children are reading correctly, that they are actually the student success we can measure correctly. 
I am not for the high stakes testing that we put so much emphasis on because we're not teaching our students like we need to teach them. They need to know basic foundations, but it starts at an earlier age. So I'm glad to see education proposals that come in that talk about students in the public sector. So uh, outside of education, what are some of the issue areas that you're making a centerpiece in your campaign in, in 2020? Uh, definitely Medicare for all. We have got to make sure that everyone receives uh, the right to receive health care and good quality health care. It's more than just having access to health care. We have access. Uh, Houston area has the Texas Medical Center, which is one of the greatest medical facilities in the world. But, but that doesn't mean everyone can go to Texas Medical Center to get quality care. And so Medicare for all is a huge piece. Also criminal justice reform. We want to make sure that we end in the cash bail bond and that black and brown people are not locked up unnecessarily for crimes and then they're taken out and hidden away from even being able to vote for issues that really affect them greatly. So uh, centerpieces, we're working on public education, Medicare for all, making sure that we uh, reform correctly the criminal justice uh, system. And we talk about that the system is broken. The system is actually not broken. It's working the way that it was designed to work. And it is race, uh, racially uh, discriminated against communities of color and we need to put an end to it. Uh, I couldn't agree more on that and your diagnosis of the issue. Uh, I'm curious, so you mentioned how uh, previously people think, oh, Texas, red state, you know, what's the point? It's so difficult. Um, we, I just this week saw some polls that showed, at least with a couple of the different potential uh, candidates who might go against Trump, him actually losing in Texas. And obviously, Beto O'Rourke came very close to beating um, Ted Cruz. Now, I know that you obviously, you have to run your campaign, you're running for Congress, you're focused on your district. Um, but is it important right. to you, are you keeping an eye on who might be at the top of the ticket that might help to make it a little bit easier across Texas? Of course, one thing that's really helping, that's gonna help us in 2020 because we're now identified as a battleground state is the energy that will be poured into Texas. Texas hasn't had that energy before, the help from outside groups. Swing Left came in and got organized and did a lot of great work. I know like in Texas seven. And so our district is one that is like 40% minority voters and it has great, great opportunity our challenge in Texas has always been voter turnout to make mm -hmm. sure that we're engaged voters with with issues that concern them, not the issues that we think are important, but the issues that concern uh, the people. Unemployment, we still have a lot of residents that are displaced from Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey, a lot of folks think if you don't live here that that was so long ago, you know, we're coming upon a new hurricane season that it's all over. It's not over for Texans. And District 14 was very hard hit by Hurricane Harvey. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are still suffering from that. So we need to make sure that systems are in place so people can recover sooner. And by the time they receive some FEMA money and people have issues with FEMA, that they haven't spent all their life savings trying to establish housing. When we have the monies available to help people grow, get back in their businesses. And so we just have to continue to engage people and drive down the issues that concern the people. Right now, the seat in Texas 14 is underserved. And our goal is to take back that seat and to take back that seat for the people because we matter. Uh, Adrian Bell, congressional candidate for Texas's 14th district. Thank you uh, for making time, uh, taking time out of your your campaigning uh, to join us on the show today. Thank you so much, John. Look forward to talking to you again. Hopefully, uh, we're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, news from around the world. In meanwhile, in. And now, time for news from around the world. It's meanwhile in. Meanwhile in space, we may soon be able to use uh, satellites orbiting the world to track down sources of emissions, including those who might be breaking the law in order to pollute more. More than a dozen governments and companies have or are planning to launch satellites that measure concentrations of heat trapping gases such as methane, which is blamed for about one quarter of man-made global warming. They're looking to track nations, industries, companies, and even individual facilities to identify some of the biggest contributors to climate change. And at least in theory, this has benefits 
not only for you know like humanity and the world to stop some of climate change, but also for some of the companies. So leaks constitute energy that could otherwise be sold. Oil and gas firms can cut 40 to 50% of their methane emissions at no net cost, which in terms of climate change is the equivalent of shutting two thirds of the coal fired generation in Asia. According to Laura Cozy, the International Energy Agency's chief energy modeler. Now. In terms of all the things that we can do, either as individuals, as an individual country, or across the world, this is obviously a small one to be able to track down these sorts of things, but it can be important. I remember not too long ago, there was issues with methane leaks in LA, and these exact sorts of technologies were employed to track that down. Now, imagine that across of the face of the earth, there might be sources of methane and other emissions that we're not even aware of. And when we're trying to model how climate change is going to proceed, we need all the information we can get. And if getting that information leads to shutting down some of these leaks, especially if they're skirting regulations and laws, that is definitely a good thing. Meanwhile, Lynn. Meanwhile, Mount Everest is long overdue for a spring cleaning and it might finally be getting it. Uh, there's gonna be a massive cleanup effort and a total of 3000 kilograms of solid waste has already been collected from Mount Everest since Nepal launched an ambitious cleanup campaign on April 14th. Honestly, considering the environment that it's taking place in, I don't know how they were able to accomplish so much in so short a period of time. I mean, one of the reasons that the waste gets left behind is because it's really annoying to cart it down when you're just doing everything you can to actually survive. But here is how we got into the mess that we're in currently. Every year, hundreds of climbers, Sherpas, and high altitude porters make their way to Everest, leaving behind tons of both biodegradable and non biodegradable waste, including empty oxygen canisters, kitchen waste, beer bottles, and fecal matter on the highest peak, which has lately acquired notoriety as the quote, world's highest garbage dump. So we, we leave. We leave poop, that's how bad it is. We don't wanna cart that down. By the way, many of you are probably familiar with this thanks to Reddit, but there are a number of bodies that are left behind up there just because it's too dangerous to actually go and try to bring them down. Maybe this is the start of an effort where not only things like beer bottles and poop effectively will be taken down, but some of those bodies might finally be recovered as well. And to give an idea of the, the scope of what they're trying to accomplish here, this is from the Director General of the Department of Tourism there said, under this campaign, we will be collecting around 5,000 kilograms of garbage from the base camp area. 2,000 kilograms of garbage will be collected from uh, the South Coal region and uh, an additional 3,000 uh, kilograms will be collected from Camp 2 and Camp 3 areas. So a massive amount of garbage and a massive effort to hopefully clean up an area that should not be bearing the permanent marks of human uh, tourism and travel. Meanwhile, in Meanwhile, in Russia, they're apparently weaponizing whales, which is a ridiculous sentence, but it, there's some reason to believe it. So uh, marine experts in Norway believe that they've stumbled upon a white whale that was trained by the Russian Navy as part of a program to use underwater mammals as a special ops force. So yes, spy whales is uh, apparently what we're working with here. I think we have a picture actually, and uh, here he is. Look at look at that shifty way he's got his head turned from the camera. What is he hiding underwater? And so why do they think that he might be some sort of Russian spy? Well, the strange behavior of the whale, which was actively seeking out the vessels and trying to pull straps and ropes from the sides of the boats, as well as the fact it was wearing a tight harness, which seemed to be for a camera or weapon, raised suspicions among marine experts that the animal had been given military grade training by neighboring Russia. Inside the harness, which has now been removed from the whale, were the words equipment of St. Petersburg. That, no, no, look, that's, that does look bad for the whale, but if he's got like a camera harness, he could just be a YouTuber. I don't know, he could be for a GoPro or something. But there is reason based in history to be a little bit worried. In 1980s Soviet Russia, a program saw dolphins recruited for military training thanks to their razor sharp vision, stealth, and good memory, making them effective underwater tools for detecting weapons. That program closed down in the 1990s. However, a 2017 report by TV Zvezda, a station owned by the Defense Ministry, revealed that the Russian Navy had again been training beluga whales, seals, and bottlenose dolphins for military purposes in polar waters. In the past three years, President Vladimir Putin has reopened three former Soviet military bases along its vast Arctic coastline, manned entirely by seals. 
no. Uh, look, it's, a, it's an interesting thing for us to be aware of, perhaps be on the lookout for. Probably not one of the biggest issues, especially on a day in which I just saw that, we, we have a little bit more time. Uh, I actually saw that Russia has now dropped out of, previously it had been one of the top military spending countries in the world. It's actually begun to backslide in overall military spending. Perhaps whales are cheap to train, I don't know. But they're saving money, putting it towards something else. That's a lesson that we could perhaps learn as a country. And it might be more important for us than worrying about uh, weapons carrying whales. In any event, that's the news from around the world. It's everything you need to worry about. Uh, before we do end though, I did wanna read at least one of the, the recent reviews. Uh, clop, 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 clop on iTunes left a review saying, nice to hear TYT anywhere. It's a breath of fresh, uncorrupted journalism in our landscape of corporate media. Uh, but he did ask for more whale related news. And so uh, he has gotten it as of today. He didn't actually ask for that. If you haven't already reviewed the podcast, please go on iTunes and do that. It helps us out immeasurably. If you're not already a TYT member, I would advise you to go to TYT.com com slash John gives us access to gives you access to our shows tons of extra content thank you for joining us on the show today we'll see you tomorrow morning thanks for listening to the full episode of the damage report support our work listen ad free access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple podcasts at apple.co slash tyt I'm your host John Darola I'll see you soon